The Honda Goldwing is undoubtedly the best touring motorbike in the world. It initially had very humble beginnings and quickly morphed into an ultra-luxury touring motorbike. Initially, when I first learned about the early days of the Goldwing, I was not sure what to think about it. It started life very differently than what it is now. The metamorphosis of this bike is fascinating for motorcycle enthusiasts. And a reason why you need a Goldwing in your life. Honda had high expectations for the Goldwing. It was called the King of Kings, and the Goldwing was coming after a time that Honda had great success with the Honda CB750. And at that time, the 750 was called the king of motorcycles. While the CB750 was Honda's flagship, Honda wanted to reach a new market, and the American market was much more focused on touring at the time. Think of the Goldwing as the Acura version of Honda, with all the new refinements and luxury that was possible to achieve in a bike for its current year. The concept for the Goldwing began in 1972. Honda had just released the CB750 in 1969, and it was incredibly popular. When we think of superbikes, we think of Ducati Panigales, Honda RC51s, but the 750 was the first real-world superbike. Sales were booming until Kawasaki unveiled the Z1900cc superbike. In 1972, the Kawasaki became the IT bike again, and the CB750 quickly became overshadowed. Instead of competing with the Z1 directly, Honda wanted to go in a different direction. The prototype for the Honda Goldwing began in 1972, and it began as the M1. The M1 was never meant to go into production. It was mainly a prototype, so Kido Iramajiri was put in charge of its design. They combined popular ideas from bikes such as the BMW and Moto Guzzi. The engine of the M1 was a 1470cc horizontally opposed engine and was coupled with a shaft drive. The M1 had 80 horsepower at 6700 rpm and a top speed of 140 miles per hour. The codename for the M1 at the time was the King of Motorcycles or the King of Kings. The M1 was an exercise in engineering. Honda was quoted, the M1 was built to find out what was possible. Mr. Honda's main concern was that most people buy do not go over 750cc's threshold of displacement. Here comes the Project 371. Lead designer Toshio Nozui had worked on a team on the Honda CB750 Superbike. He designed the engine as a flat four-cylinder engine that produced 1,000 cc's and made 80 horsepower, but at 7,500 rpm, instead of 67 rpm for the M1. It produced 63 pounds of torque at 5,500 rpm. It also had five gears and a shaft drive. The shaft drive eliminated that weird twisting effect that BMW and Moto Guzzi had. The bike was the precursor to the first production Goldwing. In the 1970s, it was an important period for the United States. The innovation of the floppy disk, it saw the launch of Microsoft, the Sony Walkman, and the VCR. In 1974, Nixon resigned over the Watergate scandal. In 1975, we saw a catalytic converters that were first introduced. The most popular movie was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It was an era of great technological and scientific advances. It was an exciting time for Honda. Honda was very successful in making small displacement engines, like the Cub. The CB750 was a great success, but Honda needed a new bike aimed at a different market the touring market, and specifically the American touring market. At that time, market segment was owned by BMW, Harley-Davidson, and Moto Guzzi. When Honda released the first Goldwing in 1975, it knocked the competitors off their feet. 
The new GL1000 crushed the competition with reliability and smoothness that even now the Goldwing is known for. Back in 1975, touring was loud with the rumbling of a V-twin ape hangers and large deflectors. But the GL was the opposite. It was a classy, smooth and quiet bike with a flat four engine and it made 80 horsepower and 63 pounds of torque. All of a sudden, there was another class of touring. With the Honda smoothness came competition from Moto Guzzi, which made another version of their V7 Cruiser. Yamaha even had the Venture Royale, eventually to compete with the Goldwing. Kawasaki had to make the Concours line of bikes, and others followed suit. But the Goldwing was still the king of kings. The GL1000. It does not resemble the Goldwings of today. Honda even designed the Goldwing logo to resemble the Honda logo, with the Honda wings being symmetrical on both sides. This tells you how much Honda wanted to make this bike be their flagship. The GL stood for Grand Luxury. And with this bike, you could tell Honda meant it. The GL1000 was fitted with the same engine and transmission that were developed in the Project 371. It had a full duplex cradle frame with a fuel tank mounted beneath the seat. The top of the tank was a glove box and housed the gas tank filler and other various electronics and even a kickstart lever. Kickstarting was possible on the first GL1000. The engine and the gas tank being so low, this made the bike very easy to ride. Honda continues this tradition in keeping the center of gravity low on their bikes even today. This bike weighed in at 650 pounds wet and they needed the weight as low as possible to be manageable. Instead of using cam chains, Honda used belts to operate the cams. This required the rider to maintain the belts and chains at regular intervals. In Honda tradition, Honda made the Honda easy to service with, with belts by removing the front cover of the engine. The main competition at the time in 1975 were the Harley-Davidson Electric Glide, the BMW R90, and the Moto Guzzi 850T, Kawasaki Z1, but the Goldwing was much more sophisticated, calmer throughout the rev range. Honda seemed to look at the competitors instead of going after beating their performance for the consumer market, they tend to refine and make bikes more sophisticated for a real world application. In 1975, Cycle World referred to the Goldwing as a Honda 1000 CC Gentleman's Choice. The name Goldwing was not yet known to riders. Not even magazines could predict the paramount importance the Goldwing was to become. Why was the GL1000 naked bike? If Honda wanted to compete with the touring market, why not provide a windscreen and saddlebags? Honda never offered saddlebags, fairing, or even a windshield in their promos, but yet marketed as, as a touring machine. Then came in Craig Vetter and his famous Windjammer Ferry. It's difficult to think of a naked Goldwing. But it was only in the 80s that we saw a first stock full fare Goldwing, which was the GL1100 Interstate. But the 70s Goldwing were a godsend to off-the-market manufacturers. The Goldwing was essentially a touring bike without any touring gear. Craig Vetter and his Vetter Windjabber became incredibly popular. Aftermarket boom for the Goldwing. Cedric Shimo, vice president of Honda International, had called Vetter in 1974 to discuss the manufacture of a new Honda design ferry. They flew him to Honda Suzuka assembly plant and showed him their ferry. It resembled the better fairing, but small. 1975, Honda delivered three production GL1000s to Illinois, and for the next year, Vetter 
went to work producing the Windjammer for the GL1000. Honda engineers came in from Honda regularly, and Vetter remarked that they were very competent and realized the reason why Honda had such a great reputation. Vetter produced the Windjammer 3 according to his own specs with Honda's permission. Vetter initially told Honda it was a mistake to make a small fairing for the American market, but Honda insisted. But in 1977, there was a fire at the Vetter factory and it, that destroyed the Honda line molds. Vetter considered this a minor setback. Honda dropped the project. Only 50 Honda line fairings were made and only one went to Japan. Throughout the GL1000 line, improvements were made. In 1977, a limited version of the GL1000 was made. 1979, it saw a new replacement, the GL1100, which was the first bike made in the United States, in Marysville, Ohio. It was an American-made motorcycle for an American audience. The bike was still manufactured in Japan, but assembled in Ohio. In 1977, the Goldwing Road Riders Association was formed in Phoenix, Arizona. Many don't realize the importance of the GL1000. It was a new touring bike with a new engine configuration. Liquid cooling, dual disc brakes, a hidden fuel tank, and a kickstart backup. And it was optimized for torque and not high horsepower. Honda also wanted to put in fuel injection, but dropped it because of possible road repairs. An automatic transmission was also rejected due to the size and weight. The GL1000 was Honda's ultimate masterpiece of engineering, but its potential was not going to be realized for some time. First year sales were a disappointing 5,000 units. The GL1000 has a special place in Goldwing history as the first Goldwing and a very unique Goldwing being born into the world naked. The GL1100 In 1979, we saw the introduction of the 1980 Goldwing GL1100. Displacement increased from 999 to 1085, but only saw one additional horsepower. This bike made 81 horsepower at 7,000 RPMs. Torque was also slightly up at 65 pounds of torque at 5,500 RPMs. We saw air suspension and an adjustable seat. This GL1100 was also more efficient than the GL1000 and saw better MPG throughout the cruising speeds due to the transmission gears ratios being shortened to keep it in the most efficient range. was produced at the new $50 million Marysville plant. The engines were still shipped from Japan to Ohio for assembly. In 1980, Honda introduced the Goldwing Interstate. This was the first full fare at Goldwing, stock from Honda. No more Vetter fairings in these models. This bike even featured a stereo sound system. And in 81, it featured a 40 channel CB transceiver. The CB radio in the 1970s gained popularity. It was essentially the Waze app of the 70s. People with the gas crisis found a way to communicate and to cooperate with other drivers to find the cheapest gas. They were also a great way to travel cross-country in low cell signals. By 1980, the Goldwing had many more competitors. The Yamaha XS1100 and the Kawasaki Z1300. But the GL1100 was the first Goldwing with a factory Honda fairing. Initially, the GL1000 was to be fared, 
But the Vetter fire, the gold wing came naked into the world. The 1100 was fared from the factory, was intentionally engineered for reliability and to improve the GL1000. It remedied the rare mechanical problems that cropped up in the GL1000. It had bigger cam bolts, grease fittings were added to the drive shaft, a larger U-joint to prevent the U-joint problem found in the original GL1000. Carburation became more lean due to emissions, and the exhaust was changed to emit more sound. The GL1100 had better MPG due to the regulations. Braking was improved with the newer brake pads, instrument panel was different, but it still had the same feel the old GL1000 had. It was the smoothness of the engine. This new Goldwing looked like the older GL1000, but with a new design touch. Honda representatives went to touring events and talked to touring riders. Honda did more research on Goldwing riders and touring riders than it ever did for any other Honda in their lineup. Goldwings always had a problem with smoking. When first started, and when they sat on the side stand for any length of time, oil would collect in the left hand cylinder and burn for several minutes. With new oil control rings on the three piston rings, this problem was solved. This GL1100 was quieter, also due to the high valve primary chain width changing from 1 inch to 1.25 inch. This removed the rattling sound the engine made on deceleration. At 60 miles an hour, the engine of the GL1100 was at 3722,000 RPM, while the GL1000 turned 3551 RPM. The Kickstarter was now gone from the GL1100. The end of the swing arm is a final drive that looks exactly like the CX500. Honda also increased the use of plastic and saved 15 pounds on the GL1100. The faux tank on the GL1100 opened differently. The GL1000 opened sideways, but now with the plastic tank on the GL1100, it had two large doors on the top. Suspension was also different for the GL1000. Honda answered the woes of the original suspension on the GL1000 with air suspension. The rider could now reduce pressure for a softer ride or add air when he wanted to carry a larger load. Honda released the GL1100 Interstate and it resembled a little bit of the BMW RT Ferry. It came with integrated turn signals, full radio, speakers, it was quite a solid feel. While the Vetter fairings required hose clamps to mount, this new interstate fairing was a very solid feeling fairing. At the time, the longest service interval in any motorcycle was for the GL 1100 at 7,500 miles. With the addition of the interstate model came the GL 1100 Aspen Cade. The Aspencade was the next level luxury for a full dress tour. Larger seat, two-tone paint, and much more storage, and all the options from the interstate. The three brakes were internally ventilated. This also meant that the weight was now 702 pounds. It also featured a digital LCD instrument panel and more comfort to the rider and passenger. GL1200 In 1984, Honda changed the touring game once again, and it went all out as a luxury tour. It was the first Goldwing that marked the start of the luxury market. Honda was in full effect developing a larger, more comfortable bike than its competitors. And at the time of launch, 1984, they were already making the next bike, the GL1500. 
The Goldwing GL-1200 pushed the limits of its four-cylinder engine. The GL-1200 is the last of the four-cylinder engines. It added power and it torque to its 1182 engine. It was considered the king of the touring class by 1984 and combined smoothness and low RPM acceleration that made riding a breeze. One of the key benefits was the hydraulic valve adjustment, which made the engine virtually maintenance free. Chassis improvements made the GL1200 agile and comfort improved. The GL1200 also had a special metallic gold paint. In 1986, the GL1200 Aspencade SEI had many features of the 85 model, but included cruise control and fuel injection and a travel computer. One of the main issues of the GL1200 was that the stator failed. And it was quite a process to fix, especially if you're out touring, as many of these were used for. One of the modifications for this year is the poor boy alternator. What it did was, uses a geometro alternator on the Goldwing for added reliability. But even with its faults, this bike is a great deal, considering a new Goldwing runs you over $27,000. This bike brand new cost at the time $6,195. Working on these bikes is quite difficult because of the amount of plastic removal. But also at the same time, the great thing about the Honda Goldwing line is that it was ultra reliable. So it often did not need any major repairs, just routine maintenance. This fuel injection system was previously used on the CX650T power plants. At the time, Fuel injection was a novelty. Honda went back to carbs in 1987. GL1500 In 1988, the introduction of the GL1500. This was an all-new bike with 1520cc flat 6 engine. It was a smoother transmission, increased fuel capacity, stiffer chassis, and improved brakes and a larger fairing. This was an all new model, completely redesigned from the ground up. We saw the beginnings of the Ultra Tour. But the GL1500 took the luxury from the GL1200 and brought it up to a new level. It had a new engine, finally a 6 cylinder engine that was 1520cc and even a reverse gear. The Honda Goldwing prototype, the M1, that was started in 1972 had a six cylinder and finally the Goldwing got a similar power plant in 1988. By some, the GL1500 is considered the best Goldwing. Honda spent a lot of time thinking about this bike and doing their research and they knew the market well. The research for this bike started the same year the Honda GL1200 launched in 1984. The GL1500 was the first Honda that was so sheltered from the elements that many owners at the time compared it to driving a car and being insulated from the elements. The machine was also a behemoth in weight. It weighed in at 793 pounds. But for some reason the bike felt lighter than the GL1200. Everything was redesigned. Honda didn't simply switch things from other bikes as they tend to do. They redesigned everything right down to the buttons. In 1990, it saw some new revisions. There was the GL1500 SE version. It had a two-tone paint, trunk spoiler, windscreen vent, lighted handle switches, adjustable float boards, foot warmers, Surprisingly enough, Honda decided to keep the GL1500 carbureted. By 89, Honda introduced the PC800 Pacific Coast, a Goldwing inspired model that featured automotive influence styling. In 91, the GL1500 Interstate arrived 
which was now the basic model. 40 pounds lighter due to the lack of reverse gear. The seat height was also 1 inch shorter on this model. In 95, the GL1500 saw many changes. The 20th anniversary badge, new chrome, slimmer side panels, and made it easier for shorter riders and many other styling design features. Suspension changed to make it stiffer and to improve handling. Honda matched the seat height with the Interstate version by making it slightly lower. Still the bike had carbs. In 1997, the clutch got stronger and it also shared some of the engine features of the Valkyrie including main bearings, pistons and ring sets, valve springs and con rods. The final drive of the Valkyrie was now fitted to this gold ring. By 1998, there were rumors circulating that a new gold wing was about to arrive, and many thought we would see the 2000 gold wing as a new, bigger, better, lighter gold wing. But by 2000, we saw another GL1500. It was quite a disappointment for Goldwing riders, expecting to see a 25th anniversary model. The only modification was that Honda dropped the white gauges, popular in the 90s, back to the black gauges. And it also got chrome rocker covers. The new Goldwing was announced in April of that year. Incredibly, the GL1500 had 13 years of being the flagship for Honda. An unheard feat of engineering, incredibly popular, and ultra-reliable. It was a modern bike, the first true large gold wing, with all the luxury American riders wanted. Major competitors by Yamaha and Suzuki were unable to beat the level of finish that Honda had. The only thing that came close was the BMW K1200 LT and was perhaps the only real competitor, but Honda had something up their sleeves. The GL1800 came in 2001. This was a long-awaited Goldwing. The GL1500 had dominated for 13 years and pushed the envelope of performance and touring. But it was getting larger and more importantly heavier. If Honda was to redesign a larger engine, it needed to at the very least keep the weight the same. So Honda built an aluminum frame that alone saved 25 pounds. And it also had a big bump of displacement from 1500 to 1800. This new power plant was 1832 cc's and made 118 horsepower and 125 pounds of torque. And at the same time managed to be lighter than the 1500. In total, the 1800 was 40 pounds less. Finally, the big news was that this model included fuel injection and ABS brakes, long overdue on the Goldwing. We saw briefly fuel injection on the GL1200, but was discontinued. There were several issues with the bike. The Bridgestone tires wore out prematurely. It had an overheating issue that affected some GL1800s and a recall to repair the lowest cross member of the frame. The GL1800 was one of the most recalled motorcycles in Honda history. In 2005 came the 30th anniversary Goldwing. The GL1800 frame was strengthened in the lower cross member area and new colors were added. Overall, the GL1800 was a better sport touring machine than the GL1500. It handled better than the 1500 with more stability at speed and near sport bike-like handling prowess. Riders finally could brag about dragging hard parts in corners before the chassis had any issues. The aluminum frame was sturdy and stiff and provided much more feedback. 
In 2006 and later models came with an optional airbag. In total, the GL1800 weighed in at 898 pounds and got 40 miles to the gallon. While the 1500 is considered a true touring bike with soft easy suspension just meant to eat up those highway miles, the 1800 became much more focused on sport touring. The earlier 1500 was brilliant and it was hard to figure out how Honda was going to best this bike. But the GL1800 was a clear cut winner and it upped the game. It was lighter, handled better than the 1500, and owners loved their GL1500s. But many, after riding the 1800, realized that it was simply a better bike. And also, the 1800 attracted a younger buyer who wanted comfort but also wanted good handling. Most riders would say if you're going to ride from Washington, D.C. to California, and you're going to do it on the highway, take the 1500. But if you're going to take back roads, take the 1800. 2010 was the last year to be produced in the United States. And in 2011, there were no gold wings that were produced in the U.S. anymore. Until manufacturing moved to Japan in 2012. Handling on the GL1800 was so good that there was a legend of a fellow rider named Yellow Wolf at the Tail of the Dragon. Yellow Wolf chased you around in the Tail of the Dragon. He became a legend and rode a bright yellow GL1800. And that goes to show you that with a bike and a rider with great skill, you can keep up with anybody in a crazy road like the Tail of the Dragon. Yellow Wolf showed what was possible with a GL1800 in the right hands. The Honda GL1800 6th Gen. This was a new remodeled Goldwing. The 6th generation of the 1800 came out in 2018. It featured two versions, a bagger version and a touring version. It was an all new machine and it didn't share any parts from the older 5th Gen. Honda wanted to reach new riders. The bike was lighter, more powerful, and it got better miles per gallon. But Honda Goldwing purists wondered if Honda strayed too much from the touring and more towards the sport touring aspect of the bike. The Goldwing has gotten more sport oriented ever since the 1500, and riders saw the direction that it was going. Physically, the new generation is smaller than the old generation. It didn't have as much wind protection as the 5th gen. Honda managed to do what they thought could not be done. Lose weight on their largest machine. And it lost 90 pounds from the new Goldwing. This bike also got more efficient due to Honda's latest tech in their flat 6 engine. The fuel tank dropped 1.1 gallon, but the range was mostly unaffected. This is the first time we saw the DCT transmission. Honda has been putting dual clutch transmissions on their bikes for a while and finally got it on the Goldwing. It made touring a breeze. The DCT is a 7 speed transmission and it shifts faster and smoother than ever before. The MSRP on the Goldwing in standard version is 23,000 for the 6 speed and 24,000 for the DCT. The Goldwing Tour starts at $26,000. The most expensive Goldwing version with the DCT and airbag 
costs about $31,000. Most riders agree that the GPS that comes on the bike is terrible. And for having a bike like the Goldwing B Honda's flagship, you would think they would put a good GPS unit on the bike. One of the beauties of the Goldwing that you can't tell from looking at it is that it has a very low center of gravity. Honda distributed the weight so evenly and with a bike this massive, it feels so much lower than any of its competition. One big complaint that owners of the new gen of the Goldwing is the smaller trunk space that can't accommodate two full-size helmets anymore. It was an improvement on the old generation. It looked much better. It handled better. It was a great sport touring machine. And more importantly, it brought in a new set of riders that otherwise would not consider the Goldwing as a viable sport touring machine. The Goldwing, to a squid like me, is very difficult to understand. Something this big should not ride this well. But it's a beautiful bike to ride every day. One thing's for sure, it surprises most bikes in many conditions. And with a well-ridden Goldwing, you can have a grin ear to ear knowing you bested some of the local squids in the mountains on your bike that's as comfortable as a couch. Riding the latest Goldwing is almost a religious experience. Perhaps a bit of black magic as this bike feels like it shouldn't handle this good. It's a bike that will take you anywhere where it's paved and in comfort and style for hundreds of thousands of miles. It's a bike unlike any other bike. You can pick a Goldwing from the early 1970s to today and would likely still be a great, reliable bike. I wouldn't steer away from the size of this bike. It handles much better than what it looks. And if you're a sport bike rider, you owe it to yourself to try a Goldwing. I really appreciate you guys watching. If you like, the video and you want to support me you can like the video and subscribe and check me out on patreon for more content thanks for watching i really appreciate it and i'll see you in the next video